So this week we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about monetary policy. We kind of touched on and introduced um, monetary policy in the last um, chapter about money banks and the Federal Reserve System. So we're going to kind of go fairly quickly, but kind of more talking about um, the how and the why the Fed actually um, conducts monetary policy. So um, we're going to kind of get into the how and the why, kind of really the goals of the Fed, and we'll talk a little bit about the tools that we mentioned in the previous chapter, but also just looking at specifically um, how monetary policy affects um, our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, talked about in Chapter 13 as well. So... um, in this case, we're going to kind of look at, you know, um, the tools that the Fed can use to influence the money su- supply specifically and look at the the money supply and demand um, graph as well. So kind of recapping what we did in the last chapter, um, when the Federal Reserve was created or the Central Bank of the U.S. was created in 1913, its main responsibility was to prevent bank runs. Um, So remember, that's when all of the depositors go to the bank and they um, try to withdraw their money and they're demanding um, uh, their, their money back to withdraw it. And so remember, in this case, the Federal Reserve acts as the lender of last resort. So here... In this chapter, we're going to be talking about monetary policy, the actions the Fed takes to manage the money supply and interest rates to pursue macroeconomic policy goals. We talked about that last chapter, so I'm not going to make you write it again. Um, When they are um, conducting monetary policy, um, they actually pursue four main monetary policy goals. So these four goals, we're going to kind of go into a little bit of depth of each one are price stability, high un- employment, stability of financial market markets and institutions, and economic growth. So since World War II, the Fed has actually carried out what's called an active monetary policy. So I'm just going to make a note, active monetary policy since World War II. Um, So that means they were actively looking at these different goals. So the first goal that we're going to talk about is price stability. So price stability is the primary goal of the Fed. And so when it comes to price stability, what we want to think about is as prices rise, the value of money as both a medium of exchange and a store of value. Both of these we talked about last chapter. Is eroded or decreases. So the next goal of the Fed is to maintain high employment. So at the end of World War II, Congress passed um, the Employment Act of 1946. It essentially stated that the responsibility of the federal government is to foster and promote conditions under which they will be afforded useful employment for those able and willing to seek work and to promote maximum employment production and purchasing power. So we really want to think about um, the idea of promote maximum employment. And um, so when we're thinking about both price stability and high employment, um, these two, one and two, these two goals are the what's called the dual mandate of the Fed. 
Okay. Our third goal is stability of financial markets and institutions. So essentially kind of maintaining stability, it's essential to a growing economy. And then also essentially what the Fed is going to do is they're going to ensure confidence in banks during times of crisis. If we think back to 2008, essentially the Fed made uh, temporary discount loans to investment banks to essentially ease liquidity problems. Then the final final policy goal is economic growth. Um, specifically, we want to think about um, stable economic growth. Remember, so if we have stability, you know, it's easier to predict the future. It's easier to make decisions um, today um, looking towards the future. And so when we have stable economic growth, it's going to encourage long-term investment which is obviously necessary it's in itself for economic growth. Um, and then, then as far as economic growth goes, um, it's not completely clear you know, how and to what extent the Fed can really encourage this long um, run, long-term investment um, beyond kind of the first three goals, which are the price stability, um, high employment, and then stability of financial markets. But, um, it's thought potentially Congress and the president may be in a better position to address this goal. So we're going to hopefully meet the three previous goals. Okay. So the next section that we're going to talk about is the money market and the Fed's choice of monetary policy targets. So the Fed has these three monetary policy tools at its disposal. We talked about that last chapter, open market operations, discount policy, and reserve requirements. Um, it uses these tools to keep the unemployment and inflation rates low. So these are chapter 14. Um, we're going to keep them low. And then the Fed directly influences its monetary policy targets. So these two targets would be the money supply... and the interest rate. So the interest rate, it's actually gonna be the primary monetary policy target. Okay. So when we're thinking about the money supply and interest rates, we actually um, have found that these two targets are related in an important way. Essentially, higher interest rates are going to result in a lower quantity of money demanded. So when we look at the demand for money, we can actually graph it out. So we have our axis is here. On the y-axis, we're going to have interest rates. I'm going to denote that using a little i. And then on the x-axis, we're going to have your quantity of money, which is um, going to be denoted with a capital M. Okay? So, essentially... Like I said, higher interest rates are going to result in a lower quantity of money demanded. Why does this happen? It's because when the interest rates high, um, alternatives to holding money are going to be look are going to look more attractive. So instead of you know keeping cash on hand, if you see higher interest rates, you're going to go put your money um, in, in in the bank in order to. Um, capitalize on those higher interest rates or you're going to you know invest those um 
essentially in like U.S. Treasury bills. So essentially what we think about is that's why the demand for money is going to be downward sloping. So money demand MD is downward sloping. Um, and we're going to want to think about, <clears throat> excuse me, when interest rates um, are high, the opportunity cost of holding money is also high. So what could potentially cause this money demand curve to shift? Again, kind of going back to chapter three even, talking about what shifts a demand curve. So in this case, what causes the money demand curve to shift? We're gonna see that um, a change in the need to hold money to engage in transactions could, and then also decreases in real GDP or the price level decrease money demand. So let's just kind of re-graph this out. We'll just show you what that looks like. So if um, there is a change in the need to hold money to engage in transactions, for example, if more transactions are taking place within the economy, um, you have a higher real GDP. Then more money is going to be needed for each transaction. So if you have a higher real GDP or more money is needed, there's a higher price level, the demand for money is going to be higher. Um, right shift. So that's, what's that going to look like? We're just going to shift it. Oh, wow. However, if we see a decrease in real GDP or the price level decreases, um, money um, demand is also going to decrease. So that's what's going to be a left shift. Okay. So now that we talked about the demand of money, let's talk about the supply. Um, in the past chapter, we saw that the Fed can alter the money supply by buying and selling U.S. Treasury securities. They do open market operations. So to, um, we're going to do open market operations. So I'm just going to show you essentially an increase in the money supply and a decrease in the money supply on our graphs. So again, we have interest rates, we have the quantity of money, you have interest rates, you have the quantity of money. We're going to have our demand curves. Okay. So Again, to increase the money supply, the Fed buys um, U.S. Treasury securities. The sellers then deposit the sales proceeds into a checking account, and the money gets loaned out, which increases the money supply. Decreasing the money supply would require selling securities. So that's covered um, extensively in the last chapter. And so if we want to increase... Um, the money supply, what we're going to do is actually assume that the money supply curve is vertical, that the Fed can completely control the money supply curve. So it's going to be a vertical supply curve. So what happens is when you increase the money supply or buy U.S. Treasury securities, it's going to shift to the right. Okay. 
Therefore, what's going to happen to interest rates? Interest rates are going to fall. On the flip side of things, if we decrease the money supply, then we're going to see an increase in interest rates. The money supply of itself does not depend on the interest rate. So equilibrium in, in this um, market is where the money um, supply and the money demand intersect. Um, essentially, when you increase the money supply, the short run interest rate is going to fall until it reaches a level at which the households and firms are willing to hold additional money. And vice versa, if you um, increase or if you decrease, excuse me, I feel like I messed up there. If you increase the money supply, interest rates are going to fall until they reach a level in which households and firms are going to be willing to hold the additional money. However, if you decrease the money supply, essentially the households and firms are going to hold less money than they want relative to other assets, which will increase interest rates. Okay. So another thing we want to think about is the Fed may choose to target a specific um, level of the money supply or a specific interest rate. So if they concentrate directly on the interest rate, um, partly um, it's because of a relationship uh, between the money supply and the real GDP. It essentially uh, broke down during the 1980s. Um, but there are many different interest rates in the economy, and the one that the Fed really targets is what's called the federal funds rate. The federal funds rate itself, it's the interest rate that banks charge each other for overnight loans. So it's important to note that the Fed, the Fed itself does not set the Fed funds rate, but what happens is they affect the supply of bank reserves through open market operations. So. Essentially, during recessions, they're going to push down the federal funds rate. And they're going to push up the federal funds rate in expansions. So pushing it down is going to encourage high employment. Raising it up is going to encourage price stability. Okay. So as far as monetary policy and economic activity, um, the ability of the Fed to affect economic variables such as real GDP depends on its ability to affect long-term real interest rates. And so um, we're going to assume in this section that the Fed affects long-term real interest rates using Fed funds. Okay. 
great. Okay. So how do interest rates themselves affect aggregate demand? We'll look at these three um, components, con consumption, investment, and net exports. Um, as far as consumption go, we have a lower interest rate. It encourages buyers. To use credit. Which increases sales on durable goods. Durable. As far as investment goes, if we have a lower interest rate, you're going to encourage investment. You're going to encourage borrowing. It's going to make it cheaper to borrow. And then stocks and... resident new residential investment are more attractive and then finally as far as net exports go if we have higher interest rates it's going to attract foreign funds so that is a poorly written s so net exports are going to decrease because of higher exchange rates So the Fed itself conducts both expansionary monetary policy and contractionary monetary policy. So expansionary monetary policy, um, that's when the Fed takes actions to decrease interest rates and to increase GDP. So this is what they're actually actively doing right now to stimulate the economy. So um, the, the Fed has lowered um, the required reserve ra um, requirement to zero, and that's in an effort to um, affect interest rates and to increase GDP. So we're gonna just see how that looks on our aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Uh, model. So remember, we had price, GDP. We had our SRAS, short run aggregate supply, and we had our um, LRAS, which is our long run aggregate supply, and then we had our aggregate demand. So in expansionary monetary policy, we're trying to um, reduce interest rates to increase consumption plus investment plus net exports. So we're gonna try we're gonna be at a position in which we're trying to actually actively um, shift our aggregate demand curve to the right. So if we decrease interest rates, we um, conduct open market operations to decrease interest rates, we're going to um, hope that that will in turn increase consumption, increase investment, increase net exports, which causes aggregate demand to shift to the right so that we go back to uh, macroeconomic equilibrium.
So at this point right here, that's what's called a recessionary gap. because we're producing below our equilibrium output. Oh, let's get back down to where we were. Okay, so now that we talked about expansionary monetary policy, let's talk about contractionary monetary policy. So sometimes the economy may be producing above potential GDP. And so in that case, the Fed's going to perform contractionary monetary policy where they're going to increase interest rates to decrease inflation. So we still have price, we still have GDP, we still have our long run aggregate supply. We have our short run aggregate supply. And then we have our aggregate demand. Okay, so why would the Fed intentionally want to reduce real GDP? So remember, the Fed is mostly concerned with long run growth and so it if it determines that inflation is a danger to long run growth it might contract the money supply to discourage inflation and maintain price stability so in increasing interest rates to decrease inflation um, the fed may perform open market operations which would cause um, uh, aggregate demand itself to shift left this time. So aggregate demand is going to shift left. Therefore, we return to macroeconomic equilibrium and maintain price stability. Track the money supply to discourage inflation and maintain price stability. Okay. So sometimes when we're looking at this again, the Fed is going to conduct these things to achieve their goals, but one may wonder, can the Fed eliminate recessions as a whole? So in showing monetary policy, the Fed um, knew how far to shift aggregate demand and was able to shift it that exactly that far in our first example of expansionary um, policy to offset um, that recessionary gap. But um, in reality, it's much harder to get that exactly right than the graphs make it appear. And so another complicating factor is that current economic variables are, are rarely known. It's hard to actually know where you are currently. You can only kind of know what's happened historically. So um, what will happen is there'll be a lag in um, information. So essentially completely offsetting a recession is not going to be realistic. Um, the best they can do is hope to kind of make recessions milder or shorter. So we're going to kind of look here at the effect of a poorly timed monetary policy on the economy. What would happen? So kind of let's suppose a recession is going to begin in August 2020. We can also think about maybe that's actually March 2020 right now. Um, what's been going on. And so what happens is the Fed may find out about the recession um, with a lag. So they might not actually find out about it till later. And so by the time they can implement expansionary monetary policy um, in, in uh, June of 2021, per se, um, the recession may have already Ended. So essentially, the Fed may have passed um, 
you know, passed a decision that has implemented monetary policy, but the effect may not have completely occurred until June. But by that time, the recession's already in, um, ended. And so if you keep interest rates too low for too long, you're going to encourage real GDP to go far beyond potential GDP, which is the example shown in contractionary monetary policy. And that could lead to um, excessive inflation. Um, and so kind of the result um, of that would be high inflation. And then the next recession will be more severe. So you can see on this graph, although the implementation of expansionary policy um, was in an effort in reaction to the recession back in August, what happened is it was already um, over. And so then the expansionary policy caused essentially inflation to get out of control. Okay. Last few things, um, really, again, not going to focus too much on the dynamic model just because it's really complicated. Um, and we just want to, I just want to make sure that you understand like the simple, um, ADAS model and how, um, the money supply is related to, um, that model. But I do want to look at a few, few more things as far as, um, the Fed setting of the monetary policy targets. So there are a group of, of kind of, I guess, policy makers called monetarists. And what they actually advocate is um, they say the Fed should actually target the money supply. And so in targeting the money supply, um, they would uh, kind of use that rather than to target aggregate demand. As far as potentially should the Fed target both the money supply and the interest rates, remember thinking about our graph, it, um, those two are actually linked. And so remember our graph, it looks something like this. So we had money supply, we have interest rates, and we had a downward sloping demand curve. Actually, this is quantity of money, and then we have our money supply here. So what happens is if we increase, if we decrease the money supply, here, let me zoom in so y'all can see it. If we decrease the money supply, what's happening is interest rates increase. And so the iPad is doing all sorts of fun things today. And so they're going to be linked. And so the Fed can't target both of them. A decrease in the money supply is going to increase interest rates and vice versa. As far as the Taylor rule goes, we're not going to get into that a lot. But it's essentially a rule developed um, by John Taylor that links the Fed's target for the federal funds rate to economic variables. And so I'm just going to write out the equation, but you're not going to have to know um, it. So it's Fed funds rate target equals current interest rate plus the equilibrium real fed funds plus one half inflation gap plus one half output gap. If you're really interested in this, um, you can read more about it in the book. Okay. And then the last couple things, as far as inflation targeting, it's the framework for conducting monetary policy involves 
the central bank announcing its target level of inflation, um, the Fed didn't explicitly announce um, its target level until 2012, and then that's when they announced an explicit target of 2% per year. And then finally, there are arguments for and against inflation targeting um, that we could get, get into, but I'm just going to go ahead and move on from that. And then finally, um, as far as policies during the recession itself, um, really there's a, a lot of analysis on kind of what happened in the 2007 to 2009 recession, but really what I want to focus on kind of what's actually happening now to kind of bring it to current events is a liquidity trap. So what happens in a liquidity trap is the Fed has reduced Fed funds rate to the point they can't push rates any lower to encourage investment. So it doesn't matter at this point in time how, how low they are trying to push interest rates down um, or, you know, affect the, the economy through um, open market operations. Um, at some point in time, they're going to hit a point where they can't push them any lower to encourage investment. Therefore, they aren't going to be able to stimulate the economy. So anyway, that kind of sums up monetary policy. Hopefully that kind of helps with this chapter and also with um, what's going on right now. If you have questions, please let me know.